yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, my goodness. I have been, uh, I've been looking at today's message with a little bit of intrepidation. Uh, Brian, that is a word. <laughs> yeah. Well, he'll probably look up. He'll say, he'll look up the words. I'm serious. So, see if they're real. But uh, anyway, uh, we've been in a series on whole families. And I've uh, so far covered whole, the whole man, um, the whole uh, couples, and whole singles. Well, today, uh, it would really be a message about whole parenting, really, how to, be, how, how to rear your children, uh, what we need to do to be parents that would, uh, that, would, that would have children that would honor the Lord, that would be great citizens, great Christians, and... Uh, and be able to bless our lives and to be a part. And what, we, what is our responsibility as parents? And really that's what it's all about. And I titled it Building Champions in a Snowflake World because, let me give you this to you, uh, because uh, we have such, such craziness going on now in, with our young people. And I know this is not news to anybody here. If you've watched any news, you've seen it everywhere. Uh, college campuses just being uh, controlled and, and, uh, and, and mobs walking around of college students. And I'm thinking, what, you know, I'm thinking to myself, what kind, of, what kind of place would that be that a group of college students could walk around and demand things and just, you know, take over the place? It's like they're not armed or anything. You know, I mean, it's like, what in the world would that be about? But we see it everywhere. I mean, not just on college campuses, but we see it all over our country. We see it not only uh, with children, but also with others, uh, adults, uh, young adults, uh, middle adults. Uh, it, it's just a, it just seems to be such a rampant thing where um, we, we, we as Christian parents, uh, what are, you know, our children are growing up in this world. My, I mean, of course, obviously, my children are grown now. And, but I have grandchildren that are growing up in this, eight grandchildren that are growing up in this kind of a crazy world we're living in, where it seems like everybody expects everything to be altered in life to fit them uh, so that they won't be offended. I mean, it's, it's almost like, and, it, and it's really crazy because, uh, you know, I grew up in a generation where, you know, all of the, uh, the young people made the adjustments and we learned how to, uh, behave and, and, and to uh, look at life and how to stay within certain boundaries and grow up and be responsible and capable and productive and blah, blah. And, and, and now it seems like we, we live in a generation where uh, everybody's looking to be offended on almost anything. I mean, it, it, it's like you, you, it really doesn't offend us. It just, we just think it should. And so, you know, you shouldn't do that. And it's got to change. And we got to make all these alterations. And it's just really killing, killing our country. Uh, man, if you were an enemy and you said, I want to I wanna destroy the United States of America, you couldn't do a better job than is being done by this, by this idiocy of, uh, of undermining everything to do with authority in this land. Because God's kingdom operates by an authority. Our country operates by an authority. Your home operates by an authority. It's intended to have a head. You know, anything without a head is dead, right? <laughs> and anything with two heads is a freak. So we don't have two heads. We have one head, and that's the way God intended it to be. And from that head comes the authority, and it filters down through those that are responsible under the authority. And, and that's the way our country is designed to work. That's the way our society has worked, and that's the way our families work. That's the way the church works. That's what God says, that Christ is the head of the body, even the church. So I'm not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. And I'm responsible to Jesus to be a responsible, capable leader, to hear him, to follow him, to obey him, and to lead all of us to follow him and obey him. And, and, and so that's what leadership is all about. And God's intended for our homes to be that way. I am interested to tell you this, that uh, what we're living in right now are certainly signs of the times. 
Um, I don't know how uh, you how up you are on anything to do with what God has prophesied all through the Bible about what life would be like before he comes. And I know every generation says, hey, we're the generation that's going to be alive right before Jesus comes. And every generation since Jesus said that, Jesus said that there will be some that won't taste death, you know, that there will be some that will be alive when he comes. And they won't have to come from a grave and rise to meet him in the air and the clouds like Thessalonians says those of us that have already gone on to be with the Lord would, would do. They will actually be on the earth alive and be taken right off. So Jesus said that, and since he, Jesus said that, every generation that has ever lived on the earth has thought they would be the generation. Now, if you follow the Bible and you know some things about what God has said in many of the books of the Bible, not just one book, the Revelation, but also many other books, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, a lot of the Zechariah, Zephaniah, a, a lot of the minor prophets and major prophets, the book of Daniel, uh, a lot of the writing in there is to tell us what's going to be happening and what the world's going to be like and what life is going to be like and how we are going to be ready and how we need to handle these things. Uh, by the way, I plan to start preaching the book of Revelation, the most neglected book, I believe, in the Bible, the most misunderstood book in the Bible, and the most misinterpreted book in the Bible. I uh, plan to start in a couple, few weeks, uh, just verse by verse, just go start at the front and go all the way to the back. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You can understand this book. This book is not intended to be confusing, mystic, or, or to, to, for you not to understand. It's called the revelation, which means the revealing, the opening up. I mean, it wasn't open to the Old Testament folks. They had no idea what it was about. A lot of the early centuries, they had no idea what it was about, but it's not, it, but it's not closed to us. God has opened it up, and His Spirit interprets it, and it's wide open for us because this is for us. And we are certainly in those days that are very close, I believe, to a lot of the events that are described in the Bible. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, so don't, you know, I'm not standing up here telling you I know exactly what's going to happen in life. I just love the Lord. I love His Word. I've studied it all my life. I've tried to be responsible and capable with the Word, uh, you know, and, and, and be responsible to the Lord and hear the Spirit of God and do my best to prepare and live and be a Christian in, in this world that we live in. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that with you uh, starting in a few weeks. And, um, and today I, I want to share uh, some insight with you about, about how to build champions in your home. Because I know that as Christian parents and Christian grandparents, and even with some of you guys, Christian great-grandparents, you, you, you want to build children that will be champions for Christ in this world that we're living in. Even though, as the days go by, it gets more and more dangerous to live for Christ. Uh, I don't know if you, this weekend you heard there were uh, some Coptic Christians. This is not the first time. This is just one in a long line of times that... There, were some, there have been some Christians in the Middle East, another group of Christians in the Middle East, uh, just uh, killed, just wiped out for, for being Christian. That's the only thing that was, nothing else, just being Christians. So we say, well, it's not happening here, and so we're not really all that worried. About, well, um, just hang on, just hang on. Uh, it's getting more and more dangerous everywhere to name the name of Christ and to be a Christian and to... Uh, and to have values that represent something godly and right and good and moral. And, and so if we want to, if we, rearing children, building children like this does not just happen. It's just like, like your marriage. I've been preaching, you know, whole men, whole families, whole couples, whole singles. On Father's Day, I'll preach whole women, you know. And, and, uh, and, and all of this is just an effort to say to you that, as a child of God, if you want what the Scripture says you can have in relationships, in a home, in marriage, family, that you're not going to find this. You're going to have to build this. You don't just stumble up on this and find, quote, the right person and presto, magically, You've got a great marriage, great relationships, and some great kids. 
it has to be done intentionally. And the Bible talks to us uh, in one particular place, and I just brought this up because I want you to see uh, basically how God involves himself with children. Just, just for a moment, I'm going to read several passages and just make you aware of this, and then we'll get into these nuts and bolts and stuff. But uh, in the Bible, there, there is, there is a, a type of uh, dedicated child that the Lord, that has been dedicated to the Lord by, by the parents before the child is even born. And the only reason I'm saying this to you, we don't do this anymore. We don't have Nazarites anymore. But the Bible had Nazarites, and they were children that were set aside, that were chosen by their parents to be special and to be unique and to be dedicated to the Lord so that the Lord could use them in some very powerful and exclusive ways. There are three people in the Bible that, are, that, are, that we know were Nazarite. One of them was, was Samson, and you remember Samson in the book of Judges, who was one of the great military conquerors and heroes of Israel and could have been the greatest, except he got very careless with his Nazarite vow, allowed his hair to be cut, and lost all of his strength and so forth. But Samson was a Nazarite. Very powerful man used by God in some very powerful ways. And then there's another Nazarite by the name of Samuel. Samuel was a prophet of God. He ended up being reared in the tabernacle of the Lord. He was, his mother was Hannah. It's just really interesting what happened. Hannah was old and she had no children. And she said, Lord, can I have a child, please? And, and all these women are making fun of me and my life is a shambles. And I want a child. And if you give me a child, Hannah said to the Lord, if you give me a child, I'll dedicate him to you and you can have him back. Well, she, it was really because she didn't really want to raise a child. She just wanted to have a child. Uh, really. I mean, she didn't want to be bothered trying to, you know, rear him and train him and teach him and all of that. She just wanted to have him so everybody quit talking about her being cursed of God. That's really all she was interested in. Because when she had the child, she gave the child to Eli, who was the priest. Well, Eli already had two sons that were reprobates, Hophni and Phinehas. They took the food in the, off the altar in the temple and, and ate it themselves. I mean, they just totally were pagan and heathen in every way, and Eli was the prophet of God, and Eli didn't, didn't, uh, uh, didn't discipline his own kids. And the big fat Eli fell off of a, I mean, he was so big and fat he could barely sit down, and he sat in a chair and fell out of the chair and broke his neck. That's how Eli died. And Hannah gave her child to that man who had already proven he couldn't rear children. And so if you're interested in your child becoming everything, you're not going to give him to somebody that's already proven that they can't rear children. So, so Samuel lives in the tabernacle, but, but regardless of that, he's a Nazarite. He's been given the Nazarite. And he becomes a great prophet of God because you'll remember him. He's the one that dealt with David. You remember when David, the little boy David out in the field, it was Samuel that came to the house to anoint David. It was Samuel that spoke to King Saul and King David. I mean, Samuel was a great man used greatly by God. And the last Nazarite is mentioned in the New Testament in Matthew, and his name is, uh, and Luke also, his name is uh, John, John the Baptist, greatly used of the Lord. Now, those are the Nazarites that are mentioned in the Bible. Those are people set aside. You say, what's a Nazarite? It's somebody that's set aside. Is somebody that's given uh, that, that is going to be unique. God, uh, we're going to set this person aside, and we're going to do everything we can to train them and teach them and grow them so they can be, be champions for you. We're going to dedicate ourselves. We're going to give them to you. And what does that mean? Well, th these are just an example, and I know we don't do Nazarites anymore, but I want to show you what a Nazarite was and how unique this thing was. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is number six, then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the children of Israel and give them these instructions. If some of the people, either men or women, take the special vow of a Nazarite, setting them, this is what a Nazarite is, setting themselves apart to the Lord in a special way. That's what a Nazarite is. 
They must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. They must not use vinegar made from wine. They must not drink other fermented drinks or fresh grape juice. They must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound by their Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from a grapevine, not even the grape seeds or skins. They must never cut their hair. We, by the way, back in the 70s, we used these verses to talk to our parents about our long hair. You know, we, we grew it long back then. If you don't, you know, look at some pictures. Man, we were nasty. Look, I'm serious. We, we thought we looked good, but we were nasty. I'm, it was, we grew old scrubby beards. Well, I mean, we were all kids, you know, and we grew what we could. And, and, uh, and, and it was, and then, and, and then the hair, you know, my hair never would grow long. I know y'all have never even seen my hair. Uh, I did have some at one time, but it was, it, it would, it would never grow long. It just puffed out, you know, to the side and, it was real thick, you know, like that, and I, had to, I couldn't, even br- couldn't even comb it. I had to brush it. Um, the comb wouldn't even make its way through there, and uh, nasty. Anyway, uh, but, we, this is, but when our parents started getting on to us about, you old long hairs, because back then it was a shame. It was looked at as being negative to have long hair. I mean, our parents didn't agree with that whatsoever. That, I mean, that was just, that's, what, that's what girls do. You know, guys don't have long hair like that. And so we would come to verses like this and say, Dad, look, this is in the Bible. These guys never cut their hair throughout the whole time of their vow. Uh, thank goodness my dad didn't know enough about it to challenge me on it. But anyway, for, for their, uh, their uh, I didn't have to worry about long hair anyway because it just puffed, so no problem with that. For they are holy. One day when I get to heaven, I'm going to shake my head like that and it's going to fill that hair down. For they are holy and set apart to the Lord. That is why they must let their hair grow long. And, and they may not go near a dead body during the entire period of their vow to the Lord, even if their own father, mother, brother, or sister has died. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, that's serious. That's serious. I mean, is that not serious? God said, look, if you're a Nazarite, you can't go near dead stuff. And if your daddy dies, you're going to have to let somebody else take care of the body because you can't go near a dead body. Or your mom or your brother or your sister. I mean, that is a serious deal right there. They must not defile the hair on their head because it is the symbol of their separation to God. This applies as long as they are set apart to God. Now that is what a Nazarite is. And all I want you to see from that, I know we don't do that and that's not what we do anymore. I just want you to see that there are people that are set aside to God for specific purposes. That that is something God does do no matter what generation we're in. It may not be done like that, but God does set people aside to be used in these critical situations. Look at Amos 2. This is just an example. Amos 2 verse 11. I choose some of your sons to be prophet and others to be Nazarites. Can you deny this, my people of Israel? Ask the Lord. In other words, God says, look, I choose some people to be prophets. I choose some people to be Nazarites. I have a generation that I'm going to choose, and there's going to be a generation that's going to be alive right before I come again. They're going to have some very unique properties. Look at this is in Luke 1. This is about John the Baptist. Just just read along with me. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. That's John's dad, old man in the temple praying every day for a son, old wife named Elizabeth, never had a child. God said to him one day, you're going to have a child, and he's going to be John the Baptist, and and this is a cousin of Jesus, by the way, and he was the forerunner of Jesus. And so Elizabeth was, was, was with child uh, in her old age while Mary was with child in her young age. And they had a lot to do with each other. But this is Mary and Elizabeth. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah, for God has heard your prayer. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness. And many will rejoice with you at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or hard liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. Now, isn't that an encouraging word to you? That in your womb, you could actually have one of your children set aside by God and, and, and could be filled with God's Holy Spirit before he was even birthed on this earth? That's an encouraging word to me. And hey, we're going to need it too. Um, and uh, even before his birth. And he will persuade many Israelites to turn to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah, the prophet of old. He will precede the coming of the Lord the first time, preparing the people for his arrival. 
He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and He will change disobedient minds to accept godly wisdom. So the job of John the Baptist, God called John the Baptist before John the Baptist ever came into this world and filled him with his Holy Spirit and gave him a mission and a purpose. And all I'm saying to you, I just want you to know about this. I know you're not John the Baptist, but I'm just saying to you that God does stuff like this, that this is not unusual for God to do, to have a generation that has a special purpose. And John is going to be great, and he was great, and John did make way for Jesus, and John did pave the path for Jesus, and John did preach repentance, and John did baptize Jesus in the Jordan River. And John was a great man who was beheaded because of his Christianity. So even in his death, he was a great champion for God. And he was here before Jesus came the first time preparing him. Now, I want you to notice in the book of Malachi, this is the last book of the Old Testament, and in the last two verses of the last book of the Old Testament, I want you to see what God says to us. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. What day is that? Well, that's the day he separates all of us from everybody else in the world. It is that fearful day that everybody who doesn't know him <laughs> keeps making fun of and joking about, about, you know, these Christians think they're going to go out of here and they're crazy. And I, I, I. Lord said, oh, just keep on laughing, funny boy. Uh, look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. How are you going to do that, God? He's dead and gone, man. He was an Old Testament prophet. Well, here's what we're going to do. His preaching will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. What is Jesus saying here to us? He's saying here to us that before Jesus comes again, there's going to be a great spiritual movement among the young people. And this movement is going to be led by a group of champions that have... In them, the spirit of the prophet Elijah. This is the Elijah generation. We've heard of the X generation, the Y generation, you know, the millennial generation. Have you heard of the Elijah generation? The generation that will be filled by God and given a special purpose to come forth on this earth before the second coming of Jesus Christ. To do what? To prepare people. To get people ready for what's about to happen to try to get as many as possible to come to Christ and to know Christ and to turn around and live for God and be what they ought to be and all of those kind of things. And, they're going to, and how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to do that by trying to get the parents to love their children like they ought to and get their children to love back to their parents like they ought to. And the Bible says that will be a revival of the land in the last days because I'm going to tell you what, when your heart is right with your earthly father, you want it to be right with your heavenly father. I'm telling you, it's just a natural desire that if you're right with God, you want to be right with everybody in your family. And that's what God says is going to happen. And I'm just telling you that that generation, I believe, is on this earth at this time. And I believe that we as the generations that love the Lord and know the Lord and are preparing for the Lord and our hearts are prepared and we're saying what can we do and what do we need to do and how can we do it and what's happening to this old crazy world and we're watching TV and we're seeing disaster and disaster and, 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 and anarchy and anarchy and, and paganism and heathenism and Christianity dying and killing and mocking and that which is, 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 is dishonorable and evil and wicked is being exalted and that which is good and honest and hopeful and helpful is being abased and put down on this earth. Man, everything that ought to be put down is being risen up. Everything that ought to be put down, uh, rising up is being put down. Man, we're living in the twilight zone. Crazy land. And you're saying, Pastor, how can this happen? Well, there's only one way I know this could be happening, and it is delusion. And you say, what is delusion? Delusion means that you've lost your mind. Delusion means you look at stuff and don't see it the way it is. Delusion means you look at things and, and it's obviously very much wrong, and you are so blind, you don't see that it's wrong. You think it's right. That's delusion. It's a mental illness. It's a mental disorder. 
And if you watch TV now and listen to any news channel, you'll see a whole bunch of it. Almost everybody that talks is full of it. It's like, what are you talking about? That is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. That is the most wicked, ungodly, evil, remote chatter I've ever heard in my life. And then people defend it, and you're going, that's delusional. Now, this is not unusual, and I didn't prepare to talk about everything I'm saying to you right now. <laughs> I didn't really prepare to do that. You see, I got about 49 points on that outline right there. That's what I plan to talk to you about, but this is just urgent, I think. What am I about to say to you? In the book of Thessalonians, uh, let me back up one, one, one other thought. In the book of Romans, I probably need to preach through the book of Romans also. The book of Romans is probably the greatest single treatise given to Christianity on this earth. It is, it, it is God's instructions, directions. It is the most, it is the most uh, uh, visual and the, most, and, and, and the greatest writing that has, in my opinion, that has ever been written to Christian people on this earth. Tremendous 16 chapters of nothing but theology from God about our lives and what we are and what He's done and what we're to do with it. And in the first chapter of the book of Romans, God begins talking about these last days that will be upon the earth and how men will be behaving, how they will be acting, what they will be doing how they'll be relating to each other. And I, I would just go ahead and start talking about it, but I'd, inf I'd offend half of you in here if I just started even saying what God said in that first chapter of the book of Romans. It's unbelievable. It's just like a today's newspaper. I'm serious, and it would offend everybody in this room. But that's what God says it's going to be, and I'll guarantee you that is exactly what it is. Then he goes on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in the, in the 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 to talk about the last days. And here's what he says about these last days. He, said, he says that one of these days, that which has been hindering evil from taking over this world like evil wants to. Make no mistake about it, guys. If the devil got his way, you would be history. If the devil got his way, he would just mutilate you. If the devil got his way, he would tear you to pieces. There's only one reason that's not happening right now as you sit here, right here in this building 2017, and that's because something is keeping him from doing that. And what is keeping him from doing that is the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is hindering him and holding him back from doing all of the evil that he intends to do on this earth. And, and as long as the Holy Spirit is holding him back, he will be prohibited from doing all of that evil that he desires. But when the Holy Spirit is removed, which will happen, by the way, when we're removed, when we're gone, he's gone. Where does the Holy Spirit live? In my heart. In my life, yeah, when, when Jesus takes us off this earth, the Holy Spirit's going with us. So all of a sudden now there's nothing to restrain this evil. And this evil is going to start mutilating and killing the world and dominating life. And, and in that passage, it, it, it is said, it is said that, that men, will be, men will be crying out to God and men will be... Men will be uh, wondering what has happened and how can this be? And, that, and, 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 and the Bible says, now listen to this, and the Bible says, and God shall send them strong delusion that they may believe the lie. Because when they had an opportunity to believe the truth, they loved their sin more than they loved God. And so now they're turned over finally to what they've always wanted, all the sin they can do. And it's going to destroy everything. 
But I want you to notice that it didn't say the devil is going to deceive them. It says God is going to send strong delusion. God's going to do this. God's going to, God's going to take the sanity of the mind away so that when you look at things, if you're part of that generation that hadn't gone with the Lord, you're left behind here, you're going to, you're going to look at things and you're going to say, where did all those Christians go? And, and, and that crazy deluded media that we watch every day is going to say, hey, you know what? Man, all that stuff about F, uh, uh, UFOs is right, man. They must have come down here and they probably got all those Christians. And your old deluded mind is going to go, you know, I think that's right. That's probably exactly what happened. Or right now, because the Russians are the center of all evil in the whole universe, and there's nothing but Russian uh, 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 chaos all over the world, they'll probably say the Russians got us. And every one of them will say, yeah, yeah, I bet you that's what happened. Trump and the Russians, yeah, that's what did it. <laughs> Delusion, man. Because God says, you didn't make a choice when you had a chance to make a choice. Oh yeah, you did make a choice. You just chose wrong. You just chose poorly. You chose your sin rather than his righteousness. And God said, okay, so I'm going to let you have everything you always wanted. All the sin you can, you can do. Only trouble is, you're going to be in a place that is going to be quickly, quickly devolving into total destruction. Good night, y'all. I'm telling you, we got a lot of stuff ahead of us. I mean, we're, we're, and, and we're going to... Well, I, I'm saying this to you, and, and I don't have any foundation for you, but just, just trust me when I say it, and I'll, I'll build some foundation for this in the days to come. Uh, I believe, and I know there's lots of discussion about this, and always has been. I've been in the ministry 40 years. It was back then. It was the same discussion as it is now. Are we Christians going to be gone before all this catastrophe starts happening? Everything in the Bible, to me, says, yes, we are. Everything in the Bible to me, everything in the Bible to me, not just one little sentence in Revelation, but everything in the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Zephaniah, the book of Zechariah, uh, book of Revelation, uh, even, in, even in Matthew where Jesus talks about it. Everything in the Bible says before all of this fatal cata catastrophic stuff starts going on, God's going to come and he's going to split the skies and then those of us who know the Lord are going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Jesus is not coming the next time to step his foot on the earth and fight a battle. You've read about that in Revelation. That's a little bit later. This time he's coming in the clouds. Thessalonians says, and you shall meet the Lord in the clouds. In other words, he's not coming to earth. You're going to him. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, the Bible says. Why are the dead in Christ going to rise first? Because they got six feet further to go. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know he hadn't shared that information with me as to why they would go first. I'm just assuming that that's God's way of saying, look, just because you've died in the Lord doesn't mean that your body's going to be left on this earth. And so the bodies are going to be recollected from everywhere, all over the earth. Some of them have been eaten by sharks. Some of them have been burned in fire. Some of them have died on the tops of mountains and, and, the, and the wind has blown their dust away. Some have been scattered in the sea. Some have been put in coffins and put in the ground. And the worms have crawled in and out. And some are paced in, 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 in nice sepulchers that are supposed to be airproof and waterproof. And they'll look like a skinny, dried up, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, what do we call them? A little stick. You know, uh, it, but, but, they'll, but, they'll, but they'll still be there, and, and, and God's going to call all of that back together, all of that, all of that, and then, and then it's going to just go like this to him. And if you happen to be alive and hadn't died yet, as soon as this happens, it, it's going to happen to you off the earth, and you're going to be rising together with them, the Bible says, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall you ever be with the Lord, is what the Bible says. The Bible says you won't ever be separated again from Jesus. You won't ever be separated from where He is. You will always, from that point on, be where Jesus is. But up until then, you have choices to make. And those choices will determine your destiny and your future. This is why, this is why if you ask me, what is life for? I would say to you, so you can make the right choice. God puts you on this earth and lets you stay on this earth for some length of time. And even if you were on this earth for a hundred years, 
or like I'm planning to be 120 years and die in good health. Uh, I'll probably be taken, the Lord will probably take me before that. I mean, you know, whether I go up with him or whether I go to the Lord, doesn't matter to me, I'm going to be with him. But, but the point being that even if you did live 120 years, that is just a blink, this, that's a twinkle of eternity. Eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever. Eternity has no beginning, has no end. It's forever. And a hundred years is nothing to eternity. But that hundred years is a chance for you, or that 50 years, or 20 years, or 40 years. However long He gives you on this earth is so that you can make a choice about where you're going to spend your eternity. That's what it's all about. And you have a choice right now on this side of eternity to get this thing right. Because, and I know, I know this is poor, this is poor um, persuasion to say one of these days, because that, that just rarely ever convinces anybody, one of these days, but it's going to be extremely vital to you as to what happens with your life. Now, how this relates to children <laughs> is uh, just take this as a prelude to what I'm going to talk about next week, all right, with children. <laughs> because we're going to have to build this generation that will be available to the Spirit of God in this Elijah generation. In these days where things have gotten so chaotic and so out of whack, what, as a parent, what do you need to teach your child? How do you need to train your child? What are the things that you need to put into your child so that your child will be a champion in this Elijah generation? I'm not talking about just a good kid. I'm talking about a godly kid. Most of us don't want godly kids. We want good kids. Yeah, yeah. Because if we have a godly kid, it's going to change our life. It's going to change our family. Dad, why are you watching that on TV? Get out of here, son. You bother me. See, we don't want godly kids. We want good kids. Good kids make good grades. They don't make mistakes. They clean up their room, and they don't give you any trouble. So we, most of the time we want good kids. We really don't want godly kids. We say we want godly kids until they start acting godly, and then, no, no, wait, wait, wait. You just want some good ones. That's, that's, that's what I want. But how do you rear godly kids? Because we're going to need them. We're going to need them. And this is just ten. Uh, what I wrote to you in this outline, ten commandments. Ten commandments of rearing champions. Ten, ten things to do that will help you build champions in your life. So we'll get that next week, all right? I'm sorry I, I took all the time today. <laughs> For just, just out going. Um, it is. It is. That's good preaching. Come get the mic, would you? <laughs> That's good preaching. That's good preaching. That is exactly right. We are the first and greatest influence in the life of our children. God holds us accountable. God holds us responsible. I want the best for my children and grandchildren. I want my children and grandchildren to go with the Lord when He comes. I don't, I don't want them left behind. I don't want them to be influenced by this, this snowflake generation that's, that's so fragile they have to have safe places all around. I mean, uh, you know... I, I just, I, that, that's delusion. It, it is. And I don't want my children buying into that mess. I don't want them to be persuaded, influenced by that at all. I want them to have sound minds, spiritual minds, spiritual hearts, to see things the way they are. And not, yeah, good roots, Bill. That's exactly right. And we have to put those in there. It begins with your relationship with the Lord. I'm going to just tell you that begins with your relationship with the Lord. You're not going to train them to have a relationship with the Lord if you don't have one. And if you don't demonstrate it before them, and model it before them, that they watch you pray about things, they hear you talk about godly things, they see you, the Bible's important to you, the Word of God is important to you, 
they see that you have certain values, that things that you value in life, and your character is at a certain level. You don't say one thing and do something else. That all comes from you. Character is something that is caught, not taught. You catch character from somebody who has it. So that's our mission. You know, we talk about our kid. Well, kid, well what about us? I mean, we're responsible for this. This is our, this is, this is our job. So I'm just going to ask you, I mean, hey, what is your relationship with the Lord like? I mean, I, I'm not, I, I know that it's a scary thought to think about a lot of stuff like that. But I'm, I'm not, I mean, I don't say that so, to make you afraid. I'm just asking you real, realistically, where are you with the Lord? Where is your heart? Do, do you know Him? I mean, have you given yourself to Him? I know you come to church and, and you're a nice person and you pay your bills and you try to be sweet and genuine to people and you not try to be ugly. I know all that. But where are you with the Lord? That's the, that's the issue. Have you invited Him to come into your life? Are you saved? You say, saved from what? Saved from all this junk I've just been talking about. How about that? Do you know Him as your Savior? Have you invited Him and said, come into my life, Lord Jesus? I open my heart to you. I admit that I'm a sinner. Have you ever, have you ever said that to Jesus? He said, Lord, I recognize that I am a sinner. I'm not just a bad person. I'm not just a person who needs you. I am a sinner, and I know it. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to wash me and make me clean. I'm, I'm asking you to clean up my life and take control of me for the rest of my life. I give myself to you completely, Jesus. That's, that's, that's salvation. That's, that's, what, that's what coming to Christ is all about. And so have you, has that ever happened in your life? Now, you don't have to use those words I use because those aren't magic words. You know, there are no magic words. You don't have certain sentences you have to say. But that's the attitude. That's what surrender is. It's giving yourself to Him completely, no holes barred. Because I'm telling you, I, you know, I, I, starting, about, starting about a year or two ago, I, I started seeing things, and I'm thinking to myself, the whole time I'm thinking, it couldn't get much worse than this, couldn't get worse than this. And lo and behold, if it's not every day, getting worse and worse and worse. I mean totally wacko worse. Not just a little bit, but just leaps and bounds of insanity. And the people that ought to be upset about it are looking at it and saying, well, that's okay. That's okay. I'm going, are you nuts? Delusion. Delusion. Keep that word in mind. Delusion. Don't be deluded. Come to Christ.